is consciousness something uniquely human and must we keep the animal body with us? Is our destiny to become the gardener caretakers of a revivified earth? Or is the earth like a placenta of some sort that we have literally sucked all the nutrition and potential out of because we're on our way to some grander, higher domain of being. Global perspectives and psychedelic poetics is what it says in the, uh, in the propaganda, which I assume is simply permission to rave about whatever comes to mind. Global perspectives. I guess what, what uh, I could say about this, from a psychedelic perspective, the thing that is uh, different for psychedelic people looking at the global dilemma that we're in and that increases, that continues to deepen around us, is that it's, uh, from my point of view, permission to hope rather than despair, because I think that uh, processes, institutions that for a thousand years or more have been building toward uh, some kind of cemetery break, some kind of definitive self-revealing moment that we now are uh, turning final, as pilots say. We're now deeply embedded in the pattern. We can see enough of what's ahead of us to begin to actually feel the texture of the end of human history. It's no longer an abstraction. Even the straight people who own the world with their uh, long-term and short-term projections looking at population growth, spread of greenhouse gases, disappearance of the ozone hole, uh, rising third world expectations, so forth and so on. When you propagate all these trends, it seems very clear that business as usual is no longer an option. Nobody's talking about that. So we're either in some kind of final fatal meltdown of the values of Western civilization revealed now after a thousand or two thousand year run to essentially be bankrupt, or we're going to transform ourselves unrecognizably. There really isn't any middle ground. The most radical and least likely uh, future of all, it seems to me, is a future in which we continue just to stumble forward as we have been since the Industrial Revolution. That's no longer an option. And so then the question becomes a sort of a Gnostic conundrum. Is this the final act of some kind of great cosmic tragedy in which intelligence rises out of the slime is shown to be inadequate and sinks back into the slime? Or is this uh, you know, a tale of uh, difficulty overcome and heroism won? And are we going to be able to shed the monkey nature and shed the ego and actually move up to some kind of shining ideal? You know, it's a if you think of us as the descendants of the angels, this is a pretty tatty circumstance we've come to rest in. On the other hand, if you think of us as the descendants of shit-hurling apes screeching through the treetops, then it's pretty amazing what has been accomplished here. Um, you know, one of the dilemmas that I feel very strongly and I'm just sort of talking off the top of my head here because whenever a crowd is small enough, I sort of feel like I'm in my own living room. We don't have to have the pretense of knowing lecturer and, uh, uh, you know, eager to be educated audience. Um, the real 
the real challenge, I think, is trying to decide what is baggage and what is ballast that's going to have to be dumped. Can the future be a celebration of humanness as we have known it, meaning in the animal body with all its uh, uh, you know, joys and pains with all its frailty and, uh, and potential for ecstasy? Or is what we call human nature somehow transcendental? And did we only rest for a moment in the monkey body as once the, the cutting edge of evolution must have rested in the great reptiles and at some earlier phase in history rested in the fish and so on. Is consciousness something uniquely human and must we keep the animal body with us? Is our destiny to become the gardener caretakers of a revivified earth or is the earth like a placenta of some sort? that we have literally sucked all the nutrition and potential out of because we're on our way to some grander, higher domain of being. I don't have the answer to these kinds of questions. I feel it very poignantly. It's very poignantly focused in the psychedelic, in the experience of psychedelic plants and psychedelic shamanism because you know, as any of you who have followed my ideas on this know, I've spent a lot of time in the Amazon basin with human populations that seem to have struck some kind of dynamic balance with the earth. And yet the paradox of that dynamic balance is that when you take the sacraments, the hallucinogenic plants of these people, you're propelled into worlds of uh, science fiction-like strangeness, transcendental dimensions of titanic implication. And then, at least I personally have come to the realization that this is how those cultures have chosen to deal with the Faustian impulse in human beings. It's been somehow confined in the domain of the imagination. We, meaning we who trace our, uh, our ancestry back to Europe, are part of a different style, a different strain of human being, if you will. We are the idea excretors, not, not uh, satisfied to have a canoe, a net, five fish hooks and uh, a bowl, but instead we take matter, we Western civilization, Western technology, and we impress upon matter ideas, millions of ideas, cities like Manhattan, uh, high performance weaponry, uh, enormous works of art, all of this is a kind of impulse, very strong in Western human beings to bring the ideas out of the domain of mind and to somehow solidify them in matter. Permanence, the cult of the West is permanence. I always feel that when you can find the obsessive center of a society, you probably have put your finger on its uh, on its central neurosis as well. I remember when I spent time in India, India is rife with talk of Shakti. Shakti is energy conceived of in various ways. It can be sexual energy or it can actually be electricity flowing through wires is called Shakti. And I realized being in India that the Indian obsession with Shakti was the consequence of there not being any that this was a society where energy had become the hardest commodity to encounter. And I think in the West, permanence is, the thing, is our great bugaboo because we uh, are born into the realization 
that everything is slipping through our fingers at the very moment that it comes into existence, the hardest psychedelic truth to assimilate, and you don't have to take psychedelics to assimilate this, if you just live, this will be hammered in on you again and again, and it's not to, well, it's a cause for exaltation, it's a cause for despair, it's that nothing lasts, nothing lasts, you know, not your fortune, not your misfortune, not your lovers, your enemies, your children, ultimately not even your own life and body. Everything fades. And so the Western response to this is the attempt to create something permanent, civilizations, enduring ideas, enduring institutions. All this is doomed to failure. And I see this Western uh, obsession with the cult of permanence as a consequence of the Western obsession with ego. Ego, to my mind, is the very thing, if you had to somehow meld each problem into the next problem to try and reduce all problems to one, what you would eventually come to is the realization that ego is what is destroying us our inability to displace our loyalty away from the unique locus of space and time represented by our own bodies. You know, community, communalism, these are the things that we fear, that we repress, and that we at the same time struggle to realize. I mean, the collapse of communism on one level was the collapse of a repressive, nightmarish, paranoid social system. But the dream which lay behind that was a dream of community, of unity, of sisterhood and brotherhood. And the great concern now is that with the collapse of even uh, a pretense of that position, that we are further fragmented, further atomized, into individual competing microbes of greed and need. And this is precisely the attitudes which will push us uh, ever closer to species extinction and to global ruin. Well, when you look at thousands and thousands of psychedelic experiences, you, to my mind, what you come away with is the notion that, you know, no matter who you are, Amazonian shaman, Hasidic rabbi, nuclear physicist, the psychedelic will dissolve boundaries. It will dissolve your boundaries and force you to realize the commonality of the flesh. You know, it's a, a startling thing to realize that really what you represent is nothing more than a point of view and that we each are such a point of view, triangulating perception through what is essentially simply a nexus of our past history. We always are talking about the past and the future, but it's worth noticing that we all managed to get here this morning, this place, this time, and not one of us has the same past as any other of us. This moment, like any moment, is not a confluence of the past. It is a confluence of many pasts. And these many pasts come into a nexus of connection and then move on to become many, many futures. The reason I'm so interested in the psychedelic potential and willing to speak about it is because I think that our, the myth of our separateness, which was the glory of our institutional accomplishments, parliamentary democracy, individual rights, uh, uh, liberation of various classes and so forth, has now turned somewhat sour. There has got to be something more to it than just turning people loose to loot the planet so that everyone can pile up more and more stuff, stuff which doesn't satisfy anyway. 
And I think in talking about the future, what we have to somehow do is dematerialize the future. And there are several ways or many ways to do this. Uh, people have preached voluntary simplicity and some people are into this. Uh, however, it's hypocritical to preach this in the third world to people who have nothing. You know, we have everything, so we've seen the fallacy of condominiums and Mercedes, so then we preach this in Bangladesh. This, this is a bit disingenuous. Uh, the dematerializing of culture. Uh, somehow, you see, what we have to recognize in the wake of the collapse of communism is that capitalism as well is a system with a fatal flaw that is set against human nature. Capitalism assumes an endlessly exploitable frontier of resources. This we have got, not. So capitalism is now essentially, unless it can be radically retooled, an anti-human philosophy. It's literally chewing up the ground we're standing on. But there is nothing in the, um, the basic notion of capitalism that says that we have to be thing dealers. This is simply the style of capitalism that we have fallen into. Somehow, we have to dematerialize existence. And I don't know whether that means virtual reality. Some of you have heard me say that my vision of a perfect future is you know, 25% of the present world population living in ecological balance, living in an apparently primitive, naked, aboriginal state. But when you step into the minds of those people and look behind their closed eyelids, there are menus hanging in bio teleelectronic space. Culture, you see, can be downloaded into a chip installed behind the eyelids so that it is, you know, freely commandable as an experience in the imagination. But if we insist on continually extracting resources from the earth and fashioning our dreams out of the stuff of earth, then our dreams are destined to turn to nightmare. It can't be any other way. So that's one thing about the future. The future needs to be dematerialized. Uh, and then, you know, since people always accuse me of being a harebrained dreamer, uh, I've tried to come up with something approaching a practical suggestion, and I, I took this need to the feet of the mushroom gods being having been challenged by somebody at a talk like this they said well you're always saying these mushrooms speak why don't you ask them uh, uh, how to save the world and I thought this was kind of disingenuous but uh, the next time I I had the telephone to hyperspace in my hot hand I did make the inquiry and uh, the suggestion which came back, I think, is at least food for thought. The suggestion was, uh, you want to save the world? You want to overcome male dominance, the momentum of consumerism, so forth and so on? Uh, every woman should bear only one natural child. This is an interesting idea, uh, whether you take it seriously as program or not. If every woman were to commit herself to bearing only one natural child, the population of the earth would fall by 50% in 40 years without war or famine or epidemic disease. If this program were continued for another 40 years, the population would fall by half again. This means in 80 years, the population of the planet could be reduced 75%. Why have we not heard anything about this, even for it to be denounced? I'm not saying it has to be embraced, but why isn't it a tiny fanatical minority advocating this? I think it's because uh, it's inconceivable in this society 
to try and practice capitalism in a situation of retreating demographics. It also would be a, a solution which would place enormous power in the hands of women. Women are often heard to complain about their powerlessness. Yet here's a plan which requires very little input from white guys. Uh, I took this idea to demographers and said, what about it? This seems so simple. Most people think there are no solutions. Here is a very simple solution. What about it? And they said, yes, well, it's more startling than you realize because women in upper class, high tech, Western society, uh, a woman, say, on the Upper East Side of Manhattan or Malibu or the Seacliff District of San Francisco, a child born to that woman will have 800 to 1,000 times more negative impact on the earth than a child born to a woman in Bangladesh. If you were to go to Bangladesh and meet a woman in the back streets of Dhaka who told you that her ambition in life was to have 900 children, you'd think you were dealing with some kind of sociopath, a kind of, a kind of typhoid Mary of the demographic scene. And yet every child born into moderately well-off yuppie families in high-tech societies is in that position. We prefer not to think of it this way. I think it's very interesting that one could make a case to uh, women in Western societies. You could say, how would you like vastly increased leisure time? How would you like increased disposable income? And how would you like to uh, take upon yourself a truly heroic social role? This is what's being offered with this suggestion to limit reproduction to one natural child. No more heroic, no more politically correct action can be taken. And interestingly, the women you want to convince of this position are the women you are most likely to be able to convince. Educated, white uh, women with uh, above average incomes. So that's a very practical suggestion, more likely to be implemented than my dream of uh, lunar inoculations with psilocybin for the entire population <laughs> to uh, dissolve the calcareous ego formations that have sprung up in the bloodstream since uh, the last full moon, which I also think would be uh, a fine idea. You see, Boundary dissolution is what is needed here. Boundary dissolution of all type. Our separateness is an illusion. There is a kind of human bedrock. That's why I think that the world sweep toward democracy is far more than simply a political trend. Democracy is not exactly a style of government per se, or exclusively. Democracy is something, is a biological institution of some sort, because there is no theory, there is no abstraction, there is no ideology. I mean, democracy is as close as you can get uh, to anarchy and still have any theory of organization at all. You know, I wrote a book which is around and about called the Archaic Revival. And that's why my belief in the Archaic Revival is what brings me out to events like this. I mean, I think the term New Age and some of these other terms are pretty trivializing and basically designed by the mavens of marketing to draw you in. Uh, but there is an impulse throughout the 20th century in Freudianism, in Abstract Expressionism, in Dada, the psychotherapy, sexual permissiveness, psychedelic experimentation, jazz, rock and roll. These are all facets of an impulse toward the archaic, toward the primitive, the non-straight, the anti-bow-tie, uh, 
the wish to blow up the staid world created by the fine ladies and gentlemen of the 19th century with their Chrysler ethics and their long dresses and all of that business. There is an impulse toward the archaic. This is very healthy. This is what happens when a society seeks to revivify itself. When the medieval world exploded in the face of the Italian city-states and the new classes that were emerging, uh, they it reinvented classicism. It was actually the second time classicism had been rediscovered. It was also trotted out by the Arabs in the ninth century when they needed a stabilizing metaphor for the Umayyad Caliphate and those civilizations. Now, in the 20th century, we can't go back to ancient Greece and Rome or Babylon. And in a sense, the New Age, I think, is an effort to go back to a kind of uh, a Minoan slash Egyptian world, which never existed except perhaps in the minds of certain menopausal theosophists. But, but the, impulse is, uh, the impulse is laudable, however screwy the results. Uh, but I think we have to reach further back that all of history is what our urtext, the Bible, tells us it is. It's a confusion, a kind of punishment, a wandering in the wilderness. And that where we really want to be is naked, singing in the rainforest, stoned, and exalted, uh, one with the souls of the ancestors, one with the, the Gaian spirit of the planet. And I don't mean to imply that psychedelics are simply act negatively, dissolving ego, dissolving social constructs, dissolving programming and neurosis. That's all true, but what is left when all this dissolving has taken place is not simply a tabla rasa, a clean slate. What is left is um, what we forgot, what we have been so long away from, which is a connection into the reality of the Gaian mind. The great news that all shamanism can attest to and is built on is the news that there is a sentient, minded, caring entity that surrounds and holds the planet in its hands, in its heart, and beyond comprehending. I mean, call it Gaia, call it God, call it the spirit of nature. It doesn't matter what you call it. It transcends the rational apprehension of higher primates. And yet it is there. We know that our own peculiar form of self-reflection emerged in just a couple of million years out of animal organization. Well, what we don't know is how many other forms of mind there are possible and how many times in the two billion year history of life on this planet uh, uh, intelligence has been able to shed the dark chrysalis of matter and launch itself into nearby dimensions in which it finds completion and happiness. Uh, and I think that this is the great news that informs the shamanic religions, that we are not alone, and that the other that we can make our way toward is not you know, a Galactarian intelligence from Beta Reticuli that is part machine symbiote, part banana slug or something like that, that the, the coherent minded entity that we make our way toward is actually a reflection of what is best in our hearts that we carry in ourselves the seed of this thing, and that we are like the, 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 the guy in the story of the prodigal son. We have fallen into history, and out of this misfortune, out of this experience, we can make gold if we return to the fold of the ancestors, if we can somehow take what we've learned from history and fold it back into the experience of being truly human. And this is the challenge. And it faces us on the political level 
of issues such as, you know, all kinds of community issues such as racism and sexism and classism. These are community issues. And then issues between the human community and the planet. Our inability, you see, to emotionally connect with the consequences of what we're doing. I mean, we as a species present a perfect picture of pathology uh, because what real psychotic behavior is, is behavior that one cannot emotionally connect with the consequences of what is being done. And when you realize that we are literally uh, looting the cradle of future human life, that we have decided that we are not simply transient occupiers of this domain, but that it is ours to trash, to use up, to do with as we wish, leaving nothing for the future, then you realize the depth of our need for immediate and widespread uh, therapeutic, indeed pharmacological, intervention on our state of mind. Because we have wandered from anything like real human values. And the reason psychedelics are so threatening in this society is because they immediately throw into high relief the internal contradictions of the dominator's style of doing business. And this is what must happen. The momentum toward catastrophe built up over centuries is immense. The only antidote to that that I have seen, extrapolating from what I've seen it do to single individuals, are the shamanic hallucinogens. Because when you cut right to the bone, what has to happen is we must change our minds. If we don't change our minds, we're going to go down with this self-generated titanic called Western civilization. And we have the power to change our minds, but it won't come from hortatory preaching. If that would work, then we would have turned the bend at the Sermon on the Mount. But as it is, I think we turned the bend uh, sometime in the 20th century, either when Albert Hoffman invented LSD, or Gordon Wasson found the mushrooms of Oaxaca, or Richard Schultes brought back news of ayahuasca from the Amazon basin. You see, we have to humble ourselves. We have to give up the titanic, ego-driven idea that we can do it by ourselves as religions and yogans and all that beady-eyed crowd are into promising. The first step on the path of self, real self-transformation is the admission that you must humble yourself so thoroughly that you need to form a pact with an organism that begins its life in a mound of manure you know, it's a true alchemical journey. You return to the dross and out of that which everyone has rejected, literally the compost uh, of, of being, you find the jewel. And the jewel can be grown, cultivated, brought to fruition, internalized, globalized, shared to create a transforming option that uh, does honor to a human experiment that has been going on far too many millennia for us to fumble the golden opportunity away. Is there anybody who's burning with their own agenda? That Oh, here's a burning person, yes. I had an experience about three years ago, now maybe four years ago, where I was on a, on a uh, it was legit, and I had a feeling that I was talking to some people, and they were telling me that when we leave this planet, we become stars. And I'm just wondering, what have you got any more on the outer space connection? Well, I mean, I think you know. I mean, it's funny for me to be talking at a at a place like this because my I am actually a rationalist. It's simply that I my experience has been very, very peculiar. And I thank God for it, because I think most rationalists actually live lives which reinforce their rationalism, maybe because they don't poke around enough 
in the edges of things. I mean, you know, we have orthodox ideology, I don't know what it is now, free markets, democracy, and physics or something, and then you press out a little bit to the fringes and you discover that reality is not only not as you supposed it to be, but it's not like anybody supposed it to be. The, the, the maps we have are largely based on uh, conjecture and naive hope. The hope that there's nobody hiding in the woods, the hope that there's nobody waiting behind the hill. Uh, when I first started taking psychedelics, it all ran pretty much according to Hoyle, uh, LSD. It seemed like a, a tremendous tool for insight into the structure of the personality, kind of high-powered, turbocharged, self-directed psychotherapy, you know, which is certainly useful, illuminating, but doesn't violate the laws of physics or threaten the uh, foundations of Western science and philosophy. What has interested me and become the focus of my personal life, I guess, are these tryptamine hallucinogens, DMT, psilocybin, and then ayahuasca, which is a, simply a strategy for making DMT orally active. And, you know, one could accept, I think, insights into one's upbringing, uh, insights into the structure of philosophy or mathematics or something like that. But what is hard to accept are, uh, you called them gibberish people. I call them self-transforming elf machines or tykes or fairies. And to my mind, this is, this is confounding. This is no mere extension of the models of the psyche that we inherit from Freud and Jung. It begins to look as though uh, that you know, the mind is not even in the brain. There's some kind of extended landscape of possibility. And I, I speak as uh, somebody who's been there, who's seen this stuff, but who doesn't, I don't have an agenda. I'm, in a sense, I'm sort of chicken shit because the motivation for my public career is to get a whole bunch of people to march with me in there, to check again. Because, uh, you know, well, I talk in the book I wrote for Bantam, Food of the Gods, about DMT because I think it's, in a sense, the... Um, the case where all the issues are most intensely brought together. Uh, it's a naturally occurring neurotransmitter, endogenous in the human brain. It also is very fast acting. It clears your system very quickly. Not only clears your system, but leaves no trace whatsoever. You can't even feel that you have done some kind of substance a half hour after you do this stuff. Nevertheless, the content of the experience itself is absolutely paradigm challenging. And the chief reason is because there are these entities in there. And on psilocybin you hear them. They speak to you, what you were describing. It's almost as though this is some kind of a, of a mandala of pharmacological approaches to the mystery and DMT lands you right in the center of the bullseye. I mean 30 seconds after smoking DMT you confront these things which look like, I mean it's very hard to force language into these dimensions and then bring it back but what they look like to me is self transforming, self-dribbling basketballs or something. I mean, they come bounding forward. When you enter into the space, there's a kind of a cheer. You know, hooray, and suddenly you're there. And this is not the cumulative effect of spirulina or hanging out at Findhorn or imbibing any of these ideologies which permit this kind of thing. I mean, I come out of uh, 
you know, Jean Genet and existentialism and Sartre, a very much more mainstream, down, dreary, Western approach. These things do not require belief to sustain their existence. You may doubt, you may deny, and yet there they are. And they, un it is not, um, it's not some kind of neutral panorama like window shopping. It's an encounter. It's a situation in which you see them, they see you, and the uh, uh, relationship between you and them is very rapidly evolving. They seem to have been waiting. And the impression I get is, well, it's not an impression I get, it's what they say. They say, here you are again. How wonderful. It's not exactly in English, you understand. And they have, um, you know, they're not made of matter. The question is, you know, what is the ontos of these things? What is their exact ontological status? And as far as I can tell, they're made of language. They're, they are not composed of DNA, sinew, tissue, and blood. They're composed of syntax. They are like self-articulating sentences or language with, that has no requirement for a speaker. It is its own self-generating system of meaning. And in, you know, the immediate impression you have is if you're a sane person is, you know, my God, what is this? And then is it okay? Am I, number one, am I still alive? And you check through, you know, take a quick inventory. Breathing, normal. Blood pressure, normal. Heart, normal. But what you're seeing is a complete replacement of the ordinary world and these things which are not enough like elves, gnomes and fairies. It's almost as though you know you would look to folklore to um, to uh, b provide evidence for the existence of these things but the elves, gnomes and fairies of folklore are a little too predictable, a little too humanoid, a little too Disney-esque for what you're dealing with. These things actually appear to be as alien a form of life as it would be possible for a human being to imagine and still cognize that it's alien intelligence at all. And they are performing an extraordinary activity in that place, which is they possess a language that can be seen with the eyes and this is fascinating to me. I really think that there's something to be learned here. This is what they want you to learn. They, they come forward, they utter statements, which remember you don't hear with your ear, but which you see as condensed sculptural objects, which are like Fabergé eggs or beautifully tooled machines of glass, shell, and crystal, except these things are in motion. They're opening up in front of you, and they're, they're pressing in. There's a kind of frantic intensity to this kind of an encounter. It's like a Bugs Bunny cartoon running backwards at twice normal speed. I mean, stuff is just flying all over, and they're saying, don't abandon yourself to amazement. Don't just go gaga with disbelief. Try and focus on what we're doing. And then if you are able even moderately to focus on what they're doing, what they're doing is they're offering you these objects. And they're saying, look at this, look at this. As it is passed before you, as you look into it, you have a very strong and I believe genuine impression that this thing that you're being shown, though it's no larger than uh, a Kaiser role, is somehow absolutely confounding to the principles and assumptions of this world. That in other words, if I could condense this thing into my hand right now, I wouldn't have to convince you, I wouldn't have to preach to you, I could just show you, say, look at this. And in the visual confrontation with this thing, it's self-evident that this is impossible. 
matter, light, they don't behave this way. It's as though you have brought back a chunk of another dimension. And, and then what they're saying about these things is, uh, you can do this, do what we are doing. And then the urgency becomes almost strident. They say, do what we're doing, do it now. And you say, wow. and, and then you feel, or I felt at any rate, an upwelling in myself, like a calling forth. Then out of my mouth comes language, or at least syntax, but without meaning. Some kind of glossolalia, where the modality of language is preserved, but the meaning is not. And it's a kind of an ecstasy. It sounds like gibberish in three-dimensional space, but in that space, it seems to be the key to unlocking a world made out of syntax and meaning. And I, you know, I come before you with all of this stuff unfinished. This is not a teaching or a system or an anything. It's an eyewitness account of a hyperdimensional automobile accident or something. We're not saying what the conclusions are. We don't know what the conclusions are. But this is big news. And when I first encountered this kind of stuff, I was, uh, I was uh, a young art historian at the University of California, and I assumed that any motif no matter how outre or bizarre, you would be able to look at the painting, folklore, and sculpture of somebody on this planet and find uh, a, a trace. And it, didn't, it seemed as though this defeated that idea. It was almost counter the idea of the collective unconscious because it argued that you, Joe, anybody, Sally, somebody, can break through on your own, an ordinary person, to a place that Verrucchio never saw, Michelangelo didn't anticipate it, Yeats didn't know, Blake hadn't a clue, Melville wasn't briefed, and yet there it is, you know? And this is, uh, uh, to me as an intellectual, it was very confusing, because I think as intellectuals we always assume that progress will be built on the, on the shoulders of the giants that have preceded us. The idea of something actually 100% brand new and unexpected is pretty daunting. And, and here, it, here it was, 30 seconds away, uh, uh, simply by the act of ingesting this natural neurotransmitter. Well, those of you who've been there know exactly what I'm talking about. Those of you who haven't been there, I can't imagine how you can even sit through this kind of thing because, you know, it makes the folks from the Pleiades and all that other stuff out there seem mundane by comparison. The other thing is we're not talking about camping out in cornfields night after freezing night with your eyes glued to the stars in wan hope. This is a no-fail method for plunging deeper into these spiritual uh, realms than the tantric yogas or the practitioners of X, Y, or Z dare scarcely suppose. It's repeatable. It's on demand. It does not depend upon your state of moral purity or, uh, you know, tantric accomplishment. It's something that is our birthright as much as our sexuality, our language, our eyesight, our appreciation of music. It's uh, an innate human thing. And, uh, you know, to try and return to the premises of your question, I tried to formulate theories about what could this be. Well, the first impression that I had, based on a reading of how weird this all was, was this must be a, a parallel continuum, a la Philip K. Dick and like that, that just apparently over some kind of neurological energy barrier that's all around us all the time, these things are there and they are not made of matter, so the laws of physics don't apply and, you know, like that. And then and then I entertained different possibilities, and I still entertain numerous possibilities because I haven't got it figured out yet. One possibility is that 
these things are actually human beings from the future. I mean, if you take the content of the experience seriously and say, I am apparently in contact with diminutive English-speaking creatures of some sort, well then, they have got to be either intelligent beings from another part of the universe or humans from uh, some extraordinarily advanced future world where human beings are now made of language and are only two and a half feet tall, so I would put it rather far in the future, or, and I just simply offer this in the spirit of, uh, of intellectual completeness, uh, if you ask a shaman or, a sh or uh, what these things are, they don't hesitate. They just say, oh, well, those are the ancestor spirits. Uh, this is what it's all about, is ancestor spirits. Well, it takes a while for the implications of this to sink in. They're talking about dead people. That's what an ancestor spirit is. They're suggesting that the dearly departed do not evanesce into sunlight or something cheerfully non-specific like that, but that this actually is uh, simply one level of a cosmic system of some sort where birth and death are transitions from level to level. Well, this is just exactly the kind of thing that I'm intellectually set up to doubt and to feel a kind of scorn for because, you know, people have been running around since time immemorial claiming this sort of thing with an incredibly underwhelming body of evidence to back them up. And yet, if you try to approach the problem scientifically, I think you would agree that in terms of likelihood, although operating in this realm, what this means, I'm not sure, but that in terms of likelihood, it's more likely that these are human souls in another dimension than that we are being contacted by friendly extraterrestrials, or even that we share the Earth with an invisible race of syntactical uh, tribal elf uh, legions of some sort. But I think this conclusion is the one that we would tend to resist most strenuously. I mean, you e e very, I think it's the most intellectually challenging position to take vis-a-vis -vis Western thinking to claim that we have to reopen the question of life after death in a serious way, not the cheerful round of reincarnation that haunts uh, some of the zanier offshoots of Eastern religion, but actually say, you know, you are going to die, and when you die, you know, you are going to undergo a metamorphosis of some sort that is not particularly going to be designed to preserve your humanness, what you call your humanness, or to set you on a cloud with lyre and gown for the rest of eternity, but that actually uh, the greatest adventure, the greatest adventures still lie ahead and uh, these things, uh, intimations of immortality are vouchsafed by these plant hallucinogens. Why this should be, why it should be possible to get a, bring, a look over the great divide, I have no idea. I think about these things constantly. My life is mostly questions. Uh, my friend Rupert Sheldrake, who some of you may know his books, he and I have talked about it. He thinks that uh, that, th that di there is a chemistry of dying, that in the same way that there is a chemistry of giving birth, there is a chemistry of dying, and that DMT parallels and anticipates this. He calls it uh, not a hallucinogen but a necroptic substance. It actually show, anticipates the death state itself. I once had the fortunate opportunity of being able to turn a, a very prominent Tibetan Lama onto DMT, a name that you would recognize, although not one of the top five, but a more wizened, older, stranger character. And I, you know, he did it, and I said, so what about it? 
you know, these people, these Tibetan Buddhists, they have a pretty good map of the territory. He said, it's the lesser lights. He said, you can't go further than that without breaking the thread of return. He said, you know, beyond this, there's no returning. And so, you know, in a very real sense, it's a look over the edge. But then, you know, even that doesn't solve all the mysteries. I mean, what is it about this wish to convey a language which is seen? What's that all about? Is it that perhaps language has always been a gift from the other? We don't, it's a little hard to picture how the kind of language I'm using right now ever got started. Uh, I mean, notice that language is a behavior. It's a behavior, that's all it is. It's something, it's a complex activity having to do with small mouth noises and the neurological processing of same. Uh, we must have been essentially as we are before language. It's like break dancing or something like that. Um, you're fully set up to do it, and people have been for millennia, but until somebody actually does it, it only exists as a formal possibility in the organism. And I wonder how many of these things uh, there are. I mean, breakdancing is an interesting example, albeit somewhat trivial, but it shows that after five, six, seven thousand years of civilization, you can come up with a behavior that nobody has ever seen uh, before. I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about language and how, what a limited tool it is, and yet how our whole world is held together by nothing more than small mouth noises. And it, it's incredible. The entirety of global civilization is held together by small mouth noises and symbolic notations of same, which have an even more rarefied level of abstraction. Our separateness, our notion of self and world, of self and species, all rest on the carrying capacity of these small mouth noises. One of the things that has interested me, some of you have heard me talk about this, is, you know, I think good psychedelic trips inspire a lot of homework, which usually means reading in curious areas. And I discovered that um, octopi, cephalopods, which in case you're not up on your evolutionary biology, these are uh, mollusca. They're not even vertebrates. They're related to escargot and banana slugs. I mean, you can hardly imagine a form of life more alien to ourselves. I mean, you know, we broke off from the other primates three million years ago, but the invertebrates and the vertebrates separated from each other about 700 million years ago. Well, uh, an interesting thing going on with octopi, most people have heard that they can change color. And most people, I think, assume this means that like certain lizards and certain butterflies, they camouflage themselves against their background. That's not what's going on. Color and texture for octopi are the um, medium of language. It's, you could almost say that an octopus is a naked mind because uh, as the octopus goes through certain internal changes, hunger, sexual need, whatever, uh, color changes accompany these in shifts of internal state and appear on the surface of the octopus. It is almost as though it wears its language like an overcoat. It is clothed in its own meaning. Well, obviously in that kind of situation you have always been suspended in an ambiance of language, unlike ourselves where apparently language was invented one bright summer day or series of bright summer days. And if you have a language such as we have, small mouth noises with culturally assigned meaning, 
In other words, if I say, where can I get a taxi, if I don't say this to a person who speaks English, it means nothing to a Ukrainian or a Chinese. Octopi don't have this problem. There are not culturally localized languages. There's only a language of the body, the genes. It's unambiguous. You see, even those of us in this room, if you were to check, uh, our internal dictionaries are different. We have only the assumption of one-to-one -one mapping of meaning. I mean, if I ask you, uh, where is the restroom, this is fairly ambiguous, unambiguous, because it deals with ordinary situations. But as soon as, as, soon as conversation leaves the main and well-trodden path of discourse, ambiguity enters into a tremendous degree. We overlook this as a courtesy to each other. I mean, you almost never hear one person say to another, now would you explain to me what I just said? The reason you don't hear this said very often is because the thin illusion of communication would break down completely uh, if we actually demanded of our listeners that they repeat back to us. The only situation in which that happens on a regular basis is the pedagogical mode where the teacher teaches and then by test and recitation determines that the pupil has understood. But in polite discourse among adults, uh, we consider this an imposition, if not an insult. So uh, somehow these creatures are elves of language, catalysts for the concrescence of cognition. And I don't know if these things can be understood. After all, we're embedded in the world created by our own meanings. Uh, C.D. Broad, I think it was C.D. Broad, wrote a book called The Meaning of Meaning. Or, no, it was F.H. Bradley, actually. I think Broad's book was called The Mind and Its Place in Nature. Uh, probably these two should be read back to back just to see how positivists handle these kinds of problems. The meaning of meaning is a real problem, but it also tends to be solipsistic or tautological. Can we expect brain to give a full accounting of brain? Can we expect mind to give a full accounting of mind? Anybody who's studied logic for 10 minutes can tell you that that's impossible because it is tautological. William Blake used to say, uh, nothing is lost. Nothing is lost. And this seems literally to be true. It seems as though, you know, something once articulated, a statement, the reverberations are unto the last syllable of recorded time. Somehow it's all there. Now, when I said these things approached and spoke in English, I didn't mean to make it sound as mundane as it might sound. You know, um, Greek religion was uh, characterized by what was called the Logos in the Hellenistic period. And the Logos was an informing voice. And all the great thinkers of, of Hellenistic times, Plato, Socrates, Xenophon, Thucydides, uh, all of these people were in contact with the Logos. It was the sine qua non of Hellenistic religion. And it was a speaking and informing voice that tells you the right way to live. Well, we don't know what to make of this. Uh, and at a certain point in the evolution of the Western mind, judging by uh, the writings of people who were contemporaneous with those times, the Logos fell silent. There was actually a date uh, some of you may know the story of the fishermen pulling their nets off the Isle of Rhodes uh, and they heard a voice from the sky say that Great Pan is dead. And this was at the change of the eon, the beginning of the age of Aquarius. Uh, it was almost as though there was something in the ancient world that has gone latent, that we can no longer touch or imagine. Um, Gordon Wasson, who discovered with his wife Valentina the mushrooms, told a very interesting story um, 
in one of his books about how in Mazatecan, uh, the, the people who are speakers of Mazatecan, when they chant what the mushroom says, uh, they have created a special form for this, which goes like this. Zabuz, 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 tz. This word tz means says. 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 I didn't know this at the time I took mushrooms the second time. And in my head, I heard the mushroom speaking in English but adding the word says to the end of the sentence. So it was almost like, you know, this thing could speak in Mazatec, it could speak in English, but it always kept its cadence and its structure. Um, the other thing about psilocybin and the DMT thing is that it, it um, seems to be a catalyst for glossolalia. This is why I think it must have had something to do with the evolution of language. I mean, when you take psilocybin, you can fall spontaneously into states of glossolalia. Sometimes on DMT, it's almost impossible to control. It just spontaneously comes out. Yeah. Oh, what is glossolalia? Glossolalia, well, here's an example of it, then I'll define it. It's, it's language-like activity in the absence of meaning. And it's a very interesting thing neurologically because notice that uh, speech, ordinary speech, is this highly variable stream of data. We are set up to make these small mouth noises. As a public speaker, I'm very aware of the fact that one can speak without tiring almost longer than you can do any other major human motor activity. And, uh, but the glossolalia, such as I just did, it is clearly under the control of rules, but it is not, there is no meaning conventionally conceived of there, but there is syntax. And I think probably that language was invented millennia before meaning, and that you could almost call, glossal, uh, you could almost call language toneless singing and that people used to sit around the campfire and amuse each other by making funny noises. As a kid, I used to do this. And then it was only much, much later that anything approaching linguistic conventionality was imposed on this, and that that's a lower function. The other thing I want to say about this glossolalia thing is, you may say, well, you're just making it up when I do that. But really, the experience I have when I do it is that I stand aside, then this variable data stream comes out through my mouth. Well, now, it has to reflect something about me. It's a statement about my internal situation in that moment. And it's evolving and changing as rapidly as if I were saying, you know, I had a migraine headache last night and I got up about four and took an aspirin and, uh, you know, I'm telling you about my situation. But the glossolalia must be speaking to something about my situation or it wouldn't be possible to do it at all. Not only is something not real unless it can be said, but the the... Count the contrapositive of that is that once something can be said, it becomes almost too real. It displaces other possibilities. I mean, so we're living in a set of constructs, some architectural, some ideological, and uh, they can be very oppressive. I mean, how do you get rid of the notion of linear time and space? Uh, very easily. It's, it's the slow work of consensus. One of the things that I feel I'm doing very consciously in these kinds of meetings is we're trying to launch and replicate memes. You, you all know this concept? A meme is the smallest unit of an idea in the same way that a gene is the smallest unit of organism. 
And so these things, DMT elves, transcendental object at the end of history, so forth, these are means. And uh, in the same way that genes are copied and spread around and that fidelity of copying is the key to genetic su success, fidelity of, m of meme replication is the key to communication. I mean, if I give a speech on something and then you hear it and then you go out and somebody says, so what did he say? And you give a completely cockeyed account of what has been said, well, then the meme has been betrayed. But if you can actually transfer the meme to somebody else's mind and then they can copy it and pass it on, then the meme, uh, it's almost as though the ideological environment were like a rainforest. Uh, or a coral reef. Evolution is taking place. Stupid memes, dumb memes, have short lifetimes and they disappear, you know. Uh, and m memes of great power are able to thrive in many intellectual and ideological niches and to make many uh, marriages of convenience with other memes and so they are stabilized and passed along. Somehow we have to become hip to the fact, to the power of language. And instead of just willy-nilly creating linguistic structures uh, sort of ad hoc, we need to begin to consciously engineer our uh, linguistic intent. And then, you know, so far in the 20th century, this has not been a program with a very happy history because only jerks have gotten a hold of it. Nazis and people with narrow social programs. They say, you know, we're not going to call each other Mr. and Mrs. or hey you. We're going to call, everybody's going to call each other comrade. And then this will create the notion of comradeship, which to a certain degree it does. But, you know, manipulating these things for political ends I mean, the, you know, the Jews, it was okay to put Jews in ovens because the official language for talking about Jews was that they were untermensch, subhuman, not like us, whoever we are. So once the definition had been changed, people said, well, it's okay to mistreat Jews. You know, they're not even really people. And this, is, this kind of thinking goes on all the time. It's called stereotyping and it always is an easier substitute. It's a, it's a cheap substitute for clear thinking. David Brown asked me the question, what about life after death? And I, it was somewhat of a sidebar. Uh, the Buddhists at the folk level in India do say you cannot attain enlightenment unless your mother is dead which is a kind of an odd notion, seeming to imply that she had to precede you into hyperspace. When you die, what you do is you literally, as appears to happen, you dissolve. And where you go is uh, forward and backward into time, not like a gas released into time, but along the tracks and trails of the genetic machinery. In other words, you flow into your children and you, you become, let, well, let's make a very simple model and say at the moment of death you become your children and your parents. A few moments later you become your grandchildren and your grandparents. You're spreading down. It's almost as though the, the thing which you were, which was this focus of ego and individuality, then it dies. And it's almost as though the mountain begins to slump back into the generalized pool of consciousness and being. That's why I have somewhat less patience maybe than I should have with the idea of, of channeling and, and uh, come as you were parties and that sort of thing. Because it seems to me the key to understanding the idea of reincarnation and past lives is that you were everybody. Of course, that's who you are. Here comes everybody. You know, you weren't just that shepherd girl or that Roman Empire emperor or that Greek. You're everybody. And you can find your way into the great genetic telephone system and ring anybody's bell in history. 
Well, then it would be absurd to claim you were that person. That would be as absurd as claiming that anybody you could call on the telephone is who you are. No, it's that we are everyone. And, you know, the great turning object in hyperspace that is the genetic, I don't know, uh, trans-dimensional object casts off glinting reflections of this personality, that personality. And astrology has a role to play here and other things. But the bottom line is uh, we are all drawn of the same stuff. I think one of the most profound insights you can have on psychedelics, and I certainly have it, is that uh, we are all interchangeable. You know, anybody could do my job, and I'm pretty confident I could do almost anybody's job. We define ourselves otherwise, but uh, you know, in watching the in watching the rise of my own career, it's just it's a kind of being deputized, chosen for the job. It's just they said, "Well, him, he can do it. He has the gift of gab, so give him the credit line." But it could have been anybody. Our uniqueness is uh, is real on one level, but on another level, it's fairly illusory. Uh, it's, it's sort of a coincidencia positorum. You have to hold these two antithetical things in your mind at once in order to p correctly perceive uh, the proper level of ambiguity that's resident in reality. It ain't simple, folks. Yeah. Can I just ask this question? Do I understand you to say that to find our truest self, we have to go back to the worm-like stage and reach out for the pharmacological, the natural pharmacological that is in the Amazon Basin and all those plants and things to find our true inner being, ego, whatever? Well, I don't think we have to go back as far as the worm-like stage. I think what we have to do is uh, we have to get out of history. History is a con game run by frightened men and their obedient stooges. Uh, what, we had a moment of happiness. There was a moment of completion. I guess I should explain my position on this. You see, there have always been dominance hierarchies in primates. As far back as you go, clear back to squirrel monkeys, there are what are called male dominance hierarchies. Well, so then, uh, in us, this is, uh, has, was interrupted by psilocybin use over a period of probably a couple of hundred thousand years. The psilocybin, forget that it's psychedelic for a moment, just think of it as an inoculation against ego. And so for 200,000 years or so, it was a dietary item which suppressed this normal monkey behavior. And, and so then females were shared, the sexual style was orgiastic, uh, there were no awareness of lines of male paternity and the children belonged to the group. This was not quote unquote natural. The natural way is for the men to dominate, to control the females, to the old tooth and claw. But for a couple of hundred thousand years, it was artificially interrupted by the presence of mushroom in the Paleolithic human diet. Well then when, because of climatological factors and other factors that we can discuss in another meeting, the mushroom became unavailable, the old monkey behaviors reemerged only about 12,000 years ago. But in the previous 200,000 years, language had been discovered, fire, tool making, song, a whole bunch of uh, forward leaps had been made. Well then when the psilocybin was withdrawn and the patterns of male dominance reasserted themselves in an environment where fire and language had been achieved, it exacerbated it. It made it much more nightmarish. It made it much more difficult to step away from. And all of history is the unhappy story of our, essentially our withdrawal and our agony over being unable to reach this connection back into the Gaian mind, which when we had it, we lived in Eden. We were balanced, uh, but, but it faded and history was the consequence. Now in the last 50 years, 
information has arrived on our plate, lo and behold, in the final ticking of the final hour of our dilemma, that actually shows us the way back if we but have the wisdom to understand this and then the fortitude to apply what we know. One more question. Can you talk just for a minute about motivation in relationship to psychoactive substances? You mean motivation to take psychedelics? To take action. To take action. Well, I think, you know, that, that the psychedelic community has not yet recognized or named itself as a community. We're well behind uh, gays and black people and all these other... Mi We're still trying to figure out if we are a community. And if we are a community and we have a domain of action, I think where it lies, it's not that we're all supposed to become dope dealers, it's that we're all supposed to become artists, that the transformation of culture through art is the proper understanding of uh, what you can do with psychedelics besides blow your own mind. And I really think, you know, what we need to do is put the art pedal to the floor and understand that this is art. We are involved in some kind of enormous piece of performance art called Western civilization. And, you know, it's been a, a C minus performance so far. And they're just about to reach out with the hook and drag us off stage unless we begin pulling rabbits out of the hat pretty furiously. Art is poised for this, but art is ambivalent because the society is ambivalent. That's why meetings like this, where you actually hear it said, the sooner the better. The clock is ticking. This is not a test. There will not be a retry. You know, this is the window of opportunity between the unknown and eternity. If not taken, then the entire enterprise could be lost. The whole thing, from the cave paintings at Lascaux to Whitney Houston, it could all go down the drain if we don't, uh, you know, act to preserve it through an act of uh, human cognition plus courage. The rainforests themselves may eventually be saved. Uh, very large conservation organizations are attempting to do that, but the the medical knowledge of how to use these plants is being lost at a tremendous rate. It will disappear in the next 30 years. There's no question about that because these people are, the young people are not learning the shamanism. They're moving into the cities and, uh, and you only have to break that kind of chain in an oral tradition. You only have to have a one generation break and the 50,000 years of accumulated medical information is gone. So uh, even in today's high-tech world, 85% of all drugs sold over the counter can be traced to plants. So if we're serious about you know, a cure to aid, new kinds of contraception, new forms of psychoactive drugs, then the, this botanical database needs to be preserved. I think that those of us who are experienced with psilocybin are in a position now to offer uh, answers to one of the most perplexing questions in the entire field of biology, which is how did it happen that over a very brief period of time, less than two million years, uh, the brain size of our species doubled and uh, in doubling became the fastest transformation of a major organ ever recorded in the history of the evolution of life. This is according to Lumsden, who's a very respected evolutionary biologist. This is a truly perplexing problem for evolution. It would be perplexing were it to occur anywhere in the animal phylogeny. But what's of particular embarrassment here is that it occurs in the phylogeny of the animal who invented the theory of evolution. So, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's particularly embarrassing. If we can't account for our own evolution, what depth and breadth has the theory when applied to the rest of nature? And, you know, one notion has been that you're looking for a transitional skeleton or intermediate forms. This has now been given up. And 
by looking at this problem, I have sort of been able to, I think, generate, an, let's call it an idea, a myth, a fantasy, an explanation for our predicament. And it goes very briefly something like this. Uh, All, all primates have what are called dominance hierarchies, male dominance hierarchies. This goes clear back into very primitive primates like squirrel monkeys. Uh, and it, it is true of us as we sit here in this room. We also have dominance hierarchies, male dominance hierarchies. This is why, uh, you know, what the squawk is uh, in the gender issue is that men have been running everything for a long, long time. But I maintain that there was a period in the history of the primates when male dominance hierarchies were interrupted and they were interrupted by the presence of an unusual element in the food supply. And this element in the food supply was psilocybin. And it acted as a kind of inoculation or unconscious vaccination against the formation of ego. And that at that moment, with uh, ego, male dom tendency to male dominance, chemically suppressed, by mushrooms in the diet, all the qualities that we take to be most human and most ennobling in ourselves emerged. Language, loyalty, community, courage, love, devotion, self-sacrifice, planning, all of these things which distinguish us from the rest of animal nature, I maintain, occurred under the catalytic influence of an exogenous neurotransmitter in the environment that was having profound effects on a monkey that was exploring a new environment and a new dietary habit. And here's the notion. Uh, our remote ancestors reached a kind of evolutionary climactic stability in the arboreal uh, forests of tropical Africa. And like most animal species that occupies, successfully occupies a niche of some sort, uh, we would have stayed that way for millions of years at equilibrium, happily eating fruit and occasionally hurling shit at each other as we conducted ourselves through the uh, forested treetops. And thought would never have entered into the matter. However, the plot thickened about three million years ago when suddenly, and for reasons that are hidden in the heart of the planet itself, the planet began to dry and the African continent became subject to waves of drought and desiccation. The, the tropical rainforests which covered Africa began to retreat and be uh, intercut with grasslands. And in these grasslands, a very rich flora, I mean, a very rich fauna of animal life developed. New kinds of animals, grass-eating, herding animals, ungulate animals, cows, bison, various forms of antelopes, so forth and so on. Meanwhile, looking, turning the camera's eye on our remote human ancestors, things are getting tougher up in the treetops. Uh, less fruit, less habitat in which to forage, and uh, whenever an animal gets under dietary pressure, it does what any sensible creature would do. It begins to experiment with new food. It begins to test food in the environment. Now, the reason animals don't ordinarily do this is because foods also contain toxins. And toxins uh, sometimes are mutagenic. So uh, the reason butterflies and birds and all kinds of animals specialize in their diets, it's a strategy to avoid mutation-causing chemicals. Well, so then what happens if you put an animal population under pressure 
for food and it starts experimenting with new forms of food, it begins having a higher incidence of mutation. And that mutation meets the selective forces of natural selection present in the environment, and lo and behold, you get sudden uh, uh, episodes of evolutionary advance. And I maintain that this is what happened to us on many levels. I mean, we are a kind of monkey, but if you set us next to our nearest relative, there are a lot of things about us that are different. Our hairlessness, uh, our, uh, the proportion of our skull to the rest of our body is a fetal ratio compared to other primates. Well. Among the new foods encountered by these now ground-foraging proto-ancestors of ours were mushrooms growing in the dung of wild cattle in this grassland environment. Now, the astonishing thing about psilocybin in small doses, and this was secured by research done by Roland Fisher in the late 50s, early 60s, is that um, in very small doses, doses so small that you don't feel buzzed or loaded or anything, in fact, you don't notice it, visual acuity increases. You can give somebody five milligrams of psilocybin and an hour later give them a standard optometric test and they will do better than if they hadn't taken the psilocybin. This is because edge detection is sensitized. Well, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out if there's a food in the environment of a hunting and gathering animal that conveys increased visual acuity, it's the equivalent of chemical binoculars, then those animals which accept that food as an item in their diet are going to have greater hunting success than those individuals that do not. And greater hunting success means greater success at feeding your offspring. And that means that there would be an outbreeding of the non-psilocybin using members of the population. In other words, natural selection would then favor those animals using, admitting the mushroom into their diet. So that little chink in the armor, that little toehold is sufficient for the long march toward the stars which is taking place in our species to begin. The next step is if you take slightly more psilocybin, uh, you experience um, what's called arousal. And arousal uh, means a kind of general restlessness, an inability to sit still, a roving and wired kind of attention. And in highly sexed animals like primates, it also means sexual arousal and in the male sustained erection. A second factor promoting outbreeding of the non-psilocybin using members of the population. In other words, you see, it was promoting what anthropologists straight-facedly call more successful copulations. And uh, uh, you don't have to be straight-faced, however. Uh, so, so this is the second step. And uh, I believe that the sexual style of these psilocybin-aroused early ancestors of ours was probably orgiastic. This seems reasonable from looking at the human styles on the earth today. And I suspect that probably uh, an orgiastic religious style based on the worship of a great horned goddess who was honored at the new and full moon became a religious style that was set in place for 10 or 15,000 years. This is what was going on. Well, now, psilocybin on its own, and even more so in combination with a social style that included orgy, will have the consequences of dissolving boundaries. You know, this is what the orgiastic style does. It erodes the concept of me 
and still more the concept of my women, my children, my tools, my territory, my hunting ground. If you have an orgiastic style, the first important consequence is that men cannot trace lines of male paternity. There, are no, there is no concept for a man of my children. There is only the concept of our children, the tribe, the group, and loyalty is transferred in that direction. Uh, the suppression of ego was very real. In, as I said earlier, in the earlier primate forms, ego, male dominance, was very strong, but it was as though this item in the diet was suppressing this previous rigid male hierarchy and into the void created by the dissolving of the social glue of these primates, there flowed a whole bunch of new behaviors. Behaviors such as uh, pair bonding based on loyalty and mutuality of need fulfillment, uh, uh, cooperation, uh, appropriate role assignment, uh, so forth and so on. In other words, it got loose. It began to work. You see, every time there was a glaciation, and there have been nine in the last million years or so, every time there is a glaciation, uh, species, including primates, get locked in to islanded areas. Well, then when the ice melts, these previously islanded populations flow together and exchange genes and there were several waves of human migration out of Africa and into the Middle East. Uh, but I maintain, on, based on the archaeological evidence, that only the last wave of migration out of Africa, which began only 20,000 years ago, uh, were the people anything other than hunter-gatherers. Always before they were just hunter-gatherers, but this last time, in the intervening glacial period, they had learned to domesticate cattle in Africa. And it was almost as though the human population was finding its way toward the cattle. And of course, in the dung of the cattle was the mushroom. So this great horned mother goddess that appears at the dawn of history is a hypostatization of the power of cattle in the human imagination. Uh, now, uh, at s these behaviors that were developed out of this encounter with psilocybin also involved religious, the, at higher doses of psilocybin, you know, remember at very low doses, increased visual acuity, mid-range doses, orgiastic sexual activity and uh, ego dissolution. At still higher doses, the revelation of a religious tremendum so bizarre and unnerving that even today we, with Husserl and all the rest of it under our belts, can barely face it. In other words, a mystery which for all of our sophistication, the breadth and measure of it can hardly be taken. And that laid the basis for a sense of religio, a sense of ritual, a sense of a relationship to a tremendum. And I don't, I don't want to present this psilocybin intoxication entirely as if it were simply ameliorating the earlier evolutionary programming in the primates. It was doing that, but it was doing something else as well because this mystery at the center of the psilocybin intoxication is not simply the contents of your unconscious mind or unfair fulfilled uh, fantasy as Freud thought, or it is, in fact, a contact with a Gaian intelligence of some sort. And if you're a rationalist, as I once was on some long-forgotten world, uh, it, this is an incredibly challenging notion that what you're getting into is actually some kind of supermind, some kind of organism that is you know, apparently in the atmosphere, in the water, in the plants, in the land, it's hard to say where it is or what it is because it was not designed for human apprehension. 
It has its own ding on sish, its own thing in itself. It's, uh, it's like a god for any century of human uh, description of it except the 20th in which we have enough knowledge about the ecosystem to say, well, maybe it's not, as Milton said, the god who hung the stars like lamps in heaven. It isn't that god. But it's the god of the oceans and the jungles and the ice caps and the rivers and the glaciers and the great schools of fish and the deserts. And it's the goddess of the earth. It's the mind of organic life on this planet. And... I believe that we were, we were its chosen vessel of manifestation in a certain domain. And this is what the Edenic myth is about. The nostalgia for paradise that haunts our species is a memory of this time, this golden era that ended as recently, you know, as 10,000 years ago. I mean, everything that we call history is a product of the traumatic break in our symbiotic relationship to the earth occasioned by uh, the, the loss of the mushroom religion, which was the Ur religion. And, you know, an obvious question that anyone who's gotten this far would ask is, well, if it was so wonderful, why was it lost? Well, uh, it was lost because the same dynamics which created it, which, were the prog which was the progressive drying of the African continent, those forces uh, accelerated and continued, and where there had been endemic grassland and vast herds and endless supplies of mushrooms, there became desert. There became dry land, scrub, retreating water holes, fewer and fewer mushrooms. The mushroom festivals, which had been at the new and full moon, became fewer in number. The mushroom supply dwindled. Special classes of people had to be appointed who would be the mushroom users. Special times of the year had to be appointed when the mushrooms could be taken. Special places in the rain shadow of mountains and near water holes became the only places where the mushrooms could be found. And at that point, uh, and these, these are processes which took millennia to occur, at that point there became an anxiety and concern to preserve the mushrooms so that in abundant times they could be gathered for times when they were scarce. And the strategy that would have naturally been hit upon would be to use honey as a preservative. In a world without refrigeration, honey is an antiseptic medium that caramelizes around fruits and like hummingbird tongues and stuff like that. You're always hearing Romans ate hummingbird tongues in honey. That's why, because it was a preservative. Problem is, honey itself has a perverse and mercurial nature and can change into a psychoactive drug. It can change into mead, which is a form of alcohol. It can ferment and become a kind of proto-beer. Well, uh, in, the, in what I develop in my book, Food of the Gods, is the idea that each drug carries baggage that we are generally not aware of. Each drug promotes certain values and suppresses others. So if psilocybin suppressed ego male paternity and promoted uh, sexual polymorphically perverse behavior then what, and consequent diminishing of ego, then what mead fermented honey promotes is the classic things always promoted by alcohol in any form. One, a false sense of verbal facility in the insidious combination with a lowering of sensitivity to social cueing. You know, you can see this in any singles bar on a crowded Saturday night. People drink because it, they think it makes them clever 
and then, able to ignore social cues from those around them, they boorishly proceed with their agenda, which usually involves getting laid or something. And, you know, I think that there was probably a thousand years in European civilization when very few people experienced sex without being bombed, because that was how people steal themselves uh, for the experience, you know. It was recommended to give distilled alcohol to soldiers on the brink of battle when it was first invented because it fortified them. Well, uh, as the mushrooms faded, these behaviors that had been previously well established in primates of male dominance and ego returned so that at the very dawn of human history you know let's say 6000 BC or so you get uh, in the absence of the psilocybin the disease of ego reemerges it's been suppressed for 50,000 years now it spreads through the population like wildfire and you get urbanization Agriculture. Agriculture leads to surplus. Surplus means an end to, set to nomadic existence. You become sedentary. You build grain towers. You fill these towers with grain. Then you have to defend them against the hungry people from the other tribe. So you get classes. Somebody has to coordinate the defense of this grain tower. Suddenly you have generals. Hierarchy. Male dominance warfare, classism, sexism, uh, you name it, you know, and the, and the phonetic alphabet and all the rest of it is not far behind. It's the fall into history. And we are the unhappy inheritors of this situation. And uh, our, you know, one of the things that is so unique about us is our um, fascination with drugs that of you know you know that elephants will break into compounds to get at rotting papayas and butterflies go for sugared rum and this and that but human beings are incredible and human beings addict to approximately 20 or 30 substances very tight physiological addictions and then there's all our ideological addictions you know, to Marxism, to capitalism, to the Republican Party, you name it. Uh, and then we have behavioral addictions of all sorts. Somebody gets up in the morning and throws open their front door, and if the Times isn't lying rolled at their feet with a red rubber band around it, they go into shock because an addiction is being interrupted. The fix, which was supposed to arrive on time, has been delayed, and now this person stomps back into their house, menace to life, wife and child, because the newspaper didn't arrive on time. So this curious tendency of our species to addict, I think, is because, you know, if a person is an addictive type, then people say, well, they probably were abused in childhood. And this is the consequence of some kind of childhood trauma. Well, I would submit to you that we exhibit this pathology. We appear to be the uh, inheritors of some kind of dysfunctional relationship. And I maintain that it was torn from us at the birth of mind when we were forced out of the African Eden and into, uh, you know, a much drier, harsher, Middle Eastern climate where we then had to toil in the veil of sorrows. Well, now, what, what is the point of this? Or is this just some revisioning of archaeology, some egghead game, or what is the point? Well, the point is that the consequences of this dysfunctional behavior stemming from ego and the dominance hierarchy in our behavior has ruined our planet toxified the air and water, allowed our population to soar beyond the carrying capacity, poisoned our lives with propaganda, and made us each feel guilty, powerless, and doomed. I mean, this is the, the major riff being run in the society at large, is that we're doomed. We've looted the planet. We've destroyed our children's future. We have the ethics of rats 
and now we're going to go down the tube. Well, I say, before we despair completely and just toss in the towel, we need to make one last try at escaping our demonic other and that the way to do it is through, and this leads me by a Viconian uh, recurso back to archaic revival. We need to reach back into time and attempt to understand what happened to us and how we fell into history and how its institutions have served us badly and diminished and degraded our humanness. And then we need to begin a fundamental reconstruction of human institutions uh, with an eye toward creating a viable, balanced, nature-honoring, human-honoring set of uh, institutions. So does this mean I advocate in a world of epidemic diseases that we return to orgies on every new and full moon? I don't think so. It's hardly possible. but. What it does mean is that um, the tool which lay behind all these changes, which was the ego-dissolving power of psilocybin, needs to be looked at very carefully. We need to examine the possibility that we could re-engineer ourselves so that we could emotionally connect with the consequences of what we have been doing to ourselves and the planet. I mean, when people take psychedelics, this is what they realize. They lose the hold on their little world. You know, they're saving money for a Mercedes or breast implants or some damn thing. You know, then you take one of these things and then you get the big picture. And then you realize just where that Mercedes lies in, uh, you know, the long march to the stars. In other words, we see this in the rainforest cultures today. They have no... A uh, high level of material culture and yet it's not because they're not interested in beauty or poetry it's that they simply live in a much more mental world than we do the peculiar obsession of the Western mind is its demonic relationship to matter that we don't believe anything is real unless it's made of stuff and you know we uh, any idea any notion has to somehow be concretized. This is a kind of neurotic response, in, in my opinion. I mean, the cultures with no, those civilizations with no material culture whatsoever are in a much more dynamic relationship to nature. It's our obsession with stuff that is pushing us toward Armageddon. I mean, we seriously propose to bring every man, woman, and child on earth to the level uh, of uh, the life standard uh, roughly approximating that of the ab average dweller of this island. Well, I've got news for you. There isn't enough metal, glass, plastic, and petroleum in the planet to do that. And in fact, it's causing the toxification of our world. Unfortunately, we live under a social system that is stuff obsessed we must have money in order to get things and the number of things around that they're telling you you need is is beyond your ever being able to satisfy yourself we have been told that what is within is nothing you know and that all meaning lies in the exterior world so only science has meaning only property has meaning uh, and in fact uh, the felt presence of immediate experience is the only thing you will ever truly possess. The felt presence of immediate experience. It's that, the quality of that that determines whether you're a happy or unhappy person. And you can be dying of intestinal parasites in some hut in the Amazon, and if your felt quality of immediate experience is superior, then you're superior to the guy who's being chauffeured around in an air-conditioned limousine in some urban center somewhere. We, our whole cultural delivery system denies this, you know? So we have the concept of entertainment and of drugs. I mean, to my mind, television is a far more insidious drug than heroin and that they're very comparable. They're cousins. 
the difference between heroin and television is that at least on heroin you can think your own thoughts. On television, they don't even give you the option to do that. You know, you uh, you imbibe a manufactured data stream, the main purpose of which is to introduce you to the cosmetically enhanced surfaces of certain products which you don't need. Uh, the average American watches six hours of TV a day. This means that millions and millions of people are being maintained in a semi-larval stage. I mean, we might as well store them in enormous underground banks somewhere, and someday we may. I mean, uh, this society is hard enough to manage. What if all these people unplug themselves and began running around making demands on the political institutions and the infrastructure? Then we'd really have a problem. So better they should stay in the suburbs. People magazine is delivered. The telly is there. They trouble no one. They, uh, but they do consume. There is no mundane future. I mean, if we had the chairman of the World Bank and uh, those people here, they draw curves that will stand your hair on end. They show you that the world population, the extraction of petroleum, the rise of, of poverty, uh, the poisoning of the atmosphere, the accumulation of toxins in the food chain, you draw all these curves and you discover that sometime between the year 2000 and 2040, life as we know it becomes absolutely impossible on the surface of this planet. That's what the sober, unstoned people say. So then the rest of us are supposed to come to terms with this in some sense and you can either despair and say, well then we're just, you know, the momentum of a thousand years of chuckle-headedness is just going to slam us into the wall of planetary limitation at a speed of about 5,000 miles an hour or we have to sort through our toolkit and find the right wrench to get this sinking submarine back up to the surface. Let's disarm Captain Nemo and his friends and uh, put the people who want to go into the lifeboats into the lifeboats and then these clowns can do any damn thing they want to. Well, when you sort through the cultural toolkit trying to find the magic key, it is hallucinogenic plants. As far as I can tell, I mean, I'm just one guy but my imp I read widely, I traveled widely, I've been around the block, and my impression is that this is a tremendous long shot, but it's the only plan around. Nobody else has any other plan. What are you supposed to do? Wait for the friendly space brothers to come and pull your chestnuts out of the fire? I just don't get, I'm underwhelmed by the evidence that that's about to occur. Maybe it's about to occur. I don't regard myself as having an answer. I more like have a clue. I sorted through, just as I assume you are doing, trying to figure out, taking seriously what Alan Watts and Joe Campbell and all those people, Jung, you know, trying to figure out what are these people talking about? Is it just abstract? Can it ever be reached? And I sat at the feet of various rishis, roshis, geishas and gurus. I swept up around the ashram and so forth and so on. And, you know, these people just don't have the moxie. I mean, maybe they've got something, but we don't have a thousand years to unravel this thing. It is a sinking submarine. Chatter is now out of bounds. Plato said, time is the moving image of eternity. And I, my model for these psychedelics is, if you push me, ultimately mathematical. I mean, I think that what that when we say we dissolve a boundary, when we say that the psilocybin dissolves all boundaries, another way of putting that is to say that we rise to a higher dimension where what were boundaries now have been erased. And I mean another dimension in a very mathematical and formal sense. And there is a dimension from which the past, the present, and the future are equally discernible and you go into that place. Shamanism, is one, a good definition of shamanism, a psychedelic definition is a shaman is somebody who has seen the end. 
That's all. And if you've seen the end, then you come back and take your place in the play with an entirely different attitude. In the uh, mountains of the Sierra Mazateca of central Mexico, there are Mixtec and Mazatec uh, Indians, the only place in the world where living mushroom cults with ancient roots still exist. The mushrooms were discovered in 1953 by Gordon and Valentina Wasson because they went to these villages and uncovered this thing. People thought it had been wiped out with the Spanish conquest, but it hadn't. It had just retreated into the Oaxacan interior and been kept alive. One way that I think about these aboriginal peoples is that... Uh, They kept the secret while we descended into history. They stayed at home and kept the old, old secrets. And we descended into matter. We made a kind of pilgrimage and we call it human history. Now it's over. Now we have to take what we've learned from this demonic pilgrimage into the domain of the material and use it to save the planet, to care for the planet. The only justification for history is if we use what we've learned to care for life on the planet. And we may end up, you know, using thermal nuclear weapons to destroy incoming space junk that imperils the ecology of the planet. There may be tasks for which only high technology is adequate. That, you know, if an asteroid is going to strike the Earth, you don't want to be a rainforest shaman in that situation. You want to be in command of intercontinental ballistic missiles with high lift capability that can take a 50 megaton weapon out there and blow this thing to smithereens. Uh, I, I see our bodhisattvic obligation as a biological obligation, that we are to care for the earth. After all, the earth cared for us, and we're like, a, we're like scabies or something, you know? I mean, it can't be very much fun for a planet to have a species on it which is always extracting petroleum and spreading plutonium around and dumping junk into the oceans and the atmosphere. I just said, you know, my God, what is this? It's a raging viral infection of some sort. And yet, we may be the means to a technology that would actually then give us a destiny, save history from just being madness, century after century of rape and pogrom and just, you know, the horror that it is. I'd like to redeem that. I'm like Stefan Dedalus. I'd like to awaken from the nightmare. Merci Eliade once made a wonderful statement. He said uh, he was comparing our culture to a dying person. And he said, uh, in the same way that a dying person sees their whole history flash before their eyes, a dying culture will frantically publish everything in one last final spasm of fear. Every Egyptian text, every Tibetan text, every Hopi prophecy, everything will be published, 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 because they're looking for answers. Somewhere it has to be. If the, did the Tibetans know it? Did the Witoto know it? Did the Inuit know it? Who knows it? We've got to find out. And eventually they'll get around to saying, well, now what about these psychedelic people? We've been jailing them and hounding them for years. They claim they have an answer. And they'll say, you know, get them. Get them on the line. We'll talk to anybody at this point. Bad times lie ahead. Things are going to get worse before they get better, but they're going to get better. The, the problem, as I see it, with the West is in a search for philosophical economy, of which there's no, nothing wrong with philosophical economy, but in, the, in a frantic search for philosophical economy, we did great damage to our intuition. And what this gave us is monotheism. Monotheism is a very good idea on the first pass and not such a good idea on the second pass because uh, if you f take a page from Jung as I try to do 
uh, you know that the religious ontology of a culture reflects its innermost psychology. And the idea of monotheism, one God, omnipresent, omnipotent, unforgiving, and everywhere, is an image of the male ego. That's all it is. It's an enshrining of the ideal personality as defined by that society. And, and yet what it creates is a complete denial of the messy, felt, pluralistic, feminine, organic, emotional side of being. So one has become enslaved to a kind of platonic abstraction of which all life and color and feeling has been poured out of it. And you just have, you know, the patriarchal ego. And this is not very far behind us. I mean, some of us were probably raised by, by people like this. You know, the idea of male rectitude. We're all pretty mellow, even the most uptight of us, compared to the style of male presentation of, say, a hundred years ago. You know, a hundred years ago, women referred to their husbands as Mr. Get into it. You know, in the 16th century, uh, medical students had to steal corpses off the gallows and from battlefields in order to do dissections because the church would not allow uh, uh, dissection of corpses to take place. So medical students of that era risked imprisonment in order to obtain corpses so that they could find out how the human body worked. This is the kind of situation that we're in. Constipated patriarchal institutions are standing directly astride the forward progress of the human race. I mean, you know, if you want to boil it down to a slogan, and I'll just leave you with this, um, we call these drug, these substances, Consciousness expanding agents. Well now, if consciousness does not play a major part in the future history of our species, then what kind of a future history are we talking about? You know, are we going to become stupider, duller, more animal-like? I don't think so. Consciousness is our defining quality. And it must be nourished, encouraged, catalyzed, never more so than now, because we have a planet in peril. The entire evolutionary enterprise may rest on the kinds of decisions we make about how we order and carry out our priorities over the next 50 years. We need all the help we can get, and these plants have always been there to render counsel and give advice to evolving human populations that would humbly and reverently seek their input. That's all. Thank you very much.